thrilled uh, to be here just because what you all are doing in practice, focusing on details, is a spiritual truth of our country. You know, we can be Democrats and Republicans, but most Americans are patriots. For over a decade now, good ideas have emanated from the BPC. Thank you for convening this very impressive group of, of thought leaders. Your organization has brought together leaders from across our society to advocate for common sense solutions to our most challenging problems. Because if it's bipartisan, it's much more likely to pass. When you have people philosophically and ideologically in two different worlds, and they put them together on a committee, that committee usually is not very productive. Once we get staffs blending, and John and I, they know that the members are friends and we talk, things can happen. Thank you, Anand, for that introduction, and to the BPC for its important efforts. Thank the bipartisan policy uh, center. You, you guys are great. I have, uh, we all have bipartisan responsibilities to this nation to defend principles that have long made America the beacon of hope. It's going to take all of us to try to turn down the temperature and really focus on what unites us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our program today. I'm Marilyn Serafini, and I'm the executive director of the health program here at the Bipartisan Policy Center. While we still don't know the result of Georgia's Senate runoff, we have a pretty good idea at this point about what the political landscape is going to look like moving forward. We know Republicans will assume control of the House, that Democrats will retain a slim majority in the Senate, and of course, the White House remains the same in President Biden's hands. We also know there will be many changes in key leadership positions on Capitol Hill, including for committee chairmen. As a bipartisan think tank, BPC is paying close attention to where the opportunities for progress are going to be, starting in 2023. And that means where can policymakers come together in a bipartisan fashion, because we know that's the key to success. Um, of course, I represent the health program here at BPC, and like you, I am paying particular attention to what we can do on health care. The bad news is that we face many health and health care challenges coming out of the pandemic, including an alarming unmet need for mental health and substance use problems, a significant health care workforce shortage, continuing high costs for care, and increasing rates of obesity. But here's the good news. Um, as we move into 2023, we have the knowledge that both Republicans and Democrats alike, they both care about these issues. There is also some must pass legislation in the next year, and that can open up some opportunities for bipartisan action. The goal of today's event is to take a closer look at what happened in the midterm election and what that means for the new political landscape and more specifically, for the ability of policymakers to make progress on health and health care. So today we're going to have two discussions during the next hour. The first will be uh, feature, the first will feature two of the absolute best public opinion and polling experts when it comes to health and health care. Bill McInturf of Public Opinion Strategies and Bob Blendon, who is Emeritus Professor of Public Health, Health Policy, and Political Analysis at Harvard. Following that panel, we're going to have a second panel where we will bring together Chris Jennings, Jim Capretta, and Amy Kniff. Chris was a leader on health care in both the Clinton and Obama White Houses, and he now has a consulting practice, and he's also a senior advisor here at BPC. Jim is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he studies healthcare, entitlement programs, and fiscal trends in advanced economics. He also serves as a senior advisor to BPC. Amy is co founder of Split Oak Strategies. She's led healthcare government relations for several entities, and she uh, has been a special assistant to the president for legislative affairs. Amy is a consultant to BPC. At any time during the event today, I would like to invite you to send us your questions for the panelists. If you're watching on YouTube, you can put your question into the chat. You can also tweet your questions again at any time during the panel. We're not going to wait till the end to start plugging these questions in. Um, you can tweet the questions to using the hashtag BPC Live. Okay, 
let's get started. We're going to start with our two um, pollsters, uh, Bob and Bill, and I'm going to turn first to Bob Blendon, who is going to talk to us. He's going to show us a few slides and help us to understand what we just saw and what it means for healthcare. Bob? Marilyn, I want to go a little bit further and do a sort of weather forecast about awesome. how the election will impact some of the discussions of the new Congress. But first, for those of you who don't follow this very closely, something has changed in this country in the last 20 years. Uh, and so at the moment, political science research says overwhelmingly, Congress members, when they vote, don't follow overall public opinion. They don't follow overall election uh, views. They follow the views of people who voted for them or identify. So in a Senate dominated more by Democrats, they're going to pay a lot more attention to what Democrats just said in this election. Uh, on the Republican side in the House, they're going to pay more attention uh, for that. Um, briefly, just uh, very quickly, and the slides are just the uh, reference points. Uh, what were the important issues and where was health in this election? Two, I'm going to briefly just summarize the actual voters' views on abortion and health care and uh, COVID, which wasn't a dominant issue, but when asked uh, uh, about it, and then to briefly close, uh, for many in Washington, they don't realize average people are not policy people. Uh, they have a set of values, and those values shape how they respond to things they hear about in, in, in the news. So I'm just briefly going to hit a few of the values, and it's just background. It's the equivalent of saying it might snow in California. Uh, so, uh, first, if we can have the first slide, the next slide. Uh, and so, if you can see it, uh, what it shows is the exit polls only give people five choices, and you have to pick the one for that. A number of polling groups, including ourselves, give uh, uh, likely voters literally 19, 20 choices and say what's really important, which allows them to say there's more than one thing that's important in this election. Uh, what you see is, I'm only gonna focus on the health, that abortion is only the top health issue in this election. Healthcare, which in the early part of the year was among the top six, is not, but we'll talk about where voters are on healthcare. And uh, COVID, uh, which was number three in 2020, ranked number 19 in the survey. Uh, so it has something for that. And uh, let me just briefly uh, summarize uh, the, the abortion issue. The abortion issue was uh, unbelievably powerful. Following the Supreme Court, the majority of people who voted on it, that is, they had opinions, they actually said it was important to their vote, voted for a Democrat. When asked what they wanted, it's simple as can be. I want uh, federal protection for Roe versus Wade, and I want abortion available in almost my, most uh, uh, circumstances. They were much broader in their views of what federal legislation should be than an average poll of all Americans. A minority of voters who actually identified abortion voted for the Republican candidate. Totally different world. What did they say? I don't want a federal law uh, that adopts Roe versus Wade. And if abortion is available only under the most limited circumstances. So let me just switch to the next poll one second on healthcare because there's a point for the healthcare audience. Uh, uh, essentially, we have seen this over the last three years with our polling. Uh, you say that you might actually vote on healthcare. What do you mean? What do you care about? And my apologies to everybody who has 100 issues they passionately care about. O over the last three years, every year it gets higher prices, prices prices. Uh, for those of you in Washington, I have to tell you, the majority of voters are not at all worried about the share of the GNP that goes to health care. It's about 11 percent. That's true of both Republicans and Democrats. What they worry about are prices. And that is the dominant issue. If you were walking around in the Congress, it's price is stupid. That's exactly what they said. And it's quite likely, given health care was higher prior to abortion and other issues uh, showing up that when healthcare comes back, prices are going to be dominant. Uh, let me do COVID without a slide just very, very quickly uh, to see where it is. Uh, the majority of Democrats, uh, when asked how good a job is the Biden administration done on COVID, good job overwhelmingly. 
How about the CDC and public health? Good job. All right, you switched to the Republican interview. Uh, he didn't do a good job. Really poor. Uh, how about the CDC? Sorry, really poor here. Uh, for that, how about the two policy issues before the Congress? Should we spend more money in the next session to provide funding for vaccine subsidies, mass testing treatments domestically? Democrats overwhelmingly yes, Republicans overwhelmingly no. How about developing countries? Give aid to developing countries. Democrats overwhelmingly yes, Republicans overwhelmingly uh, uh, no. So that, that shapes where you are. And the last quick slide we'll do has to do with, uh, again, uh, I, I'm very sensitive here. Half your voters did not graduate college. They are not in the middle of these policy, uh, how this does this or that. So if you ask them a few set of questions, you really get a shape of what they overall believe and what they'll look at a member of the Congress and the Senate. Uh, first is, should the federal government be doing a lot more to solve big problems? Democrats, yes. Republicans, no. Uh, is it the responsibility of the federal government to make sure everybody has universal coverage? This is a 30-year-old question. Uh, Republicans, no. Democrats, yes. How do you feel about the ACA? Democrats, I really like it. This is a great piece of legislation. Republicans, I still don't like it after all, all these years. And, and lastly, because the top issue in the election uh, was inflation, you asked the question, President Biden had these very large bills that included big health components, public health, health care, et cetera. Do you think they caused inflation or not? Uh, that's a top issue. Democrats say, absolutely not. These bills did not lead to the inflation. Republicans say absolutely yes. So when you put this snapshot together, you see the tension that will occur and you see if you're looking for a middle way, you've got to find some way through it. But from a distance, that's, Marilyn, what the forecast looks like with a Democratic leading Senate and a Republican leading House. Thanks, Bob. So Bill McInturf, what does this election, what are the key takeaways for you? What should we really be paying attention to here? What does this mean? Was there anything that Bob said that uh, perhaps you don't just, you don't agree with, or are there any points that need to be brought up here? Well, again, focusing on healthcare, I want to just perhaps echo Bob about the centrality of the concern about how, how it affects people's lives. Whenever you talk to people about the affordability of healthcare, the issue pops. Uh, just a few numbers. 41% uh, of people in one of our surveys said that they were very concerned and they had to postpone medical care because of the concern about cost. That's 41%. Two thirds said a major medical bill could lead to personal bankruptcy. And in that, and I'm so great we have a second panel, only 6% only said they were confident that Congress would do anything to reduce health care prices in the next year. So the gap between their personal concerns their, and their trust and confidence is, is massive. Um, as we look forward, uh, uh, I, I think there are a few kind of healthcare things on the, on the table that maybe the next panel can address. First, we're gonna have a Republic majority. Uh, Republicans, uh, when go back to 2020, when we talked about vaccines, we talked about whether people in Medicaid would get them. And, and, but what's happened now is it's a political decision. A third of Trump voters, conservatives and Republicans or more say they've not been vaccinated. There's a new set of issues in healthcare, which is this huge chunk of unvaccinated people. And in the Republican party in general, there is enormous negative attitudes about the FDA, CDC and federal government agencies. And so funding these agencies in the next two years with Republican majorities, I think is gonna be a challenge. I think other things you're gonna see is telehealth went from 10%, I've had that experience in 2019 to 54%. These legis around the country, the legislative battles about how we reimburse physicians for telehealth will be a thing. We're hearing more about the disparity in healthcare, about how we deal with healthcare disparities. And there's a new issue that I think is very much on the horizon that could easily be on Congress's lap, which is people are now telling us they're very aware about the issue of staff shortages in hospitals um, and these labor issues between how nurses are compensated, uh, labor tensions because of the cost of care, burnout. Uh, this, I think this staff issue is an issue that in 
my more than 20 year career of doing healthcare polling, we haven't seen before, but I think it's gonna be very much on the table. So if you ask me, what are the three or four legislative challenges that are coming out of the public polling data, those would be the things that I would highlight. So let me ask both of you, um, are those, how does that public opinion then translate into the reality of what policymakers are going to hear? And where did you see potential bipartisan support from the public that could translate into bipartisan support for uh, policymakers wanting to get anything done on a particular issue? Happy to let Bob jump in first. All right, uh, quickly, so just to follow up to agree with Bill. Uh, nobody worries about a rail strike until you have one. And that is one serious issue. No one worries about running out of nurses uh, un until institutions do. And so Bill is correct. That's going to be a crisis issue and suddenly people are going to uh, articulate. In terms of the general issues where you can find agreement, uh, you absolutely have, and again, uh, the issue of open opioids and fentanyl and those problems. Uh, it turns out it affects rural America, urban America. People are really worried about that. And there's some agreements that, that can be reached uh, uh, on that. Uh, uh, the telehealth, as I say, everybody is terrific unless you're telling people their premiums are going up by 10%. Uh, so uh, we can do that. Things that don't conflict with the big values are the large expenditure programs uh, 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 are going to be this. But I want to emphasize uh, just a, a point that Bill made. I think the biggest worry for this country and politically is whether or not we can find our way out of this quandary of the polarization of epidemics. Uh, this has not been the history of the country. We've been had that nobody had a Republican and Democratic view on smallpox uh, or polio or something like that. And if there's some way out that we can deal with the really antipathy and anger that Republicans feel about many of these policies and, and work that out, that's absolutely critical because we're gonna have this again. But at the moment, the divides are very sharp, but the hope is it hasn't been true for a hundred years. We haven't had these partisan divides on epidemics. There may be a way out of this. I don't have an optimistic answer. Um, one of the things that's happened is the number of uh, seats that are different between how you voted for president and how you voted for Congress. So there was an era for most of my career where 150 to 180 congressional seats, they would vote one way for president, one way for Congress. In 2020, that was down to 16 House seats. Today, it's 26 seats. What that means is something Bob alluded to is that each party, the, the men and women who are sitting in these seats in the House, they're not worrying about losing a general election. They're worrying about losing a primary or being challenged from the left on the Democrat side on the right. And so it means that when Bob talked, Bob's using the word values to talk about the role of government, um, that those are core things to each party. Bob had that great slide that just showed you that the two parties are almost opposite across every key issue we talked about. And uh, when you get to the value about what's the perceived role of government in health care, um, I, don't, I don't see much room for, uh, for compromise. I, I, I would say in terms of uh, points, though, in terms of common is there is no appetite. Bob has been talking about this for a very long time. It continues today. There's no appetite, including among Republican seniors, to see a significant reduction in Medicare. Uh, Medicare reform has been something Republicans drifted to when they had a majority in 96. They drifted to uh, private accounts and Social Security in uh, 2005. And every attempt to deal with those two programs has not gone well for the Republicans. And it would not go well if they used this incredibly narrow majority to try to deal with those, that, those, uh, the reforms of uh, Medicare and Medicare financing. And how did seniors come out in this election? Um, well, there's a survey by our, uh, my, our friends and uh, Tony Fabrizio and John Anzalone who polls for Biden. They did a special survey for ARP amongst people over 50. And one of the major findings of that survey was that women over 65 from the summer to their post-election moved by double digits to the Democrats, partially because of the discussion that came up 
about whether Republicans would change Social Security and Medicare. Yes. Uh, it was uh, ill-timed for our some of our candidates and leaders to talk about that issue before having a majority. And you can see the footprints of that in uh, Tony and John's work in the ARP post-elect uh, among those voters. Marilyn, so just so Bill and I can help some of your listeners, uh, every other election, there's a group of Republicans who want to take on the most popular program, that's the Social Security in the United States, totally restructure it. It has been a loser from the day that Ronald Reagan said, there's a line, we're not going there uh, for that. And, and it just shows up. So that doesn't mean you can't change payments to providers and the benefits, but you cannot threaten uh, the stability of people who are retired. It is a huge voting block of people who are very nervous about their financial circumstances. Yeah, and I'm, I'm turning 70 and I get the money starting in October. So my, my views on this have shifted over these years. <laughs> So, what about you both mentioned uh, prices? Are there particular areas in particular uh, where uh, where the voters are most concerned about prices? And this has been the top healthcare issue for a very long time. Does that translate into any kind of action with this particular Congress? Any better chance that it could that it could happen based on, is it coming to a head or are we seeing the same thing we've always seen here? So, oh, go ahead, Bill. No, I was just gonna say, I think that uh, the, is that well, we have what I call these surrogate debates about healthcare, which is it's so complicated, you pick an easy issue to be the way to deal with it. So an easy way to deal with the cost was the Democrats saying, okay, let's negotiate uh, Medicare drug pricing. Um, we did work for NBC News, or one of, and we tested 25 different issues about ways to be more or less likely to vote for a candidate. And so, anything about prescription drugs tests really well, and anything that's uh, that's a critique of the health insurance companies and their uh, their turning down or being responsible for decisions about care are always popular. Um, but we. Our political system, especially with these narrow majorities, is not set up well to deal with fundamentally, gosh, how do we pay for health care? So we, in these campaigns, we find these little bite-sized ways to kind of attack the issue so that we can be, you know, people running for office can be talking about it in ways that make them sound um, sympathetic to voters. I was, by the way, surprised that more Democratic candidates were not talking about drug pricing and the the Biden change to negotiate health care, I thought it was kind of weirdly underrepresented in the campaign we just ran in 2022. So my just brief view is uh, in surveys that we have uh, that we looked, voters were very short term. If they were solving their problem in the next six months, it really moved them. If you told them that 2026, all these prices were going to be dealt with, and uh, questions, we did not see a lot of response. It really was very immediate. Are the gas prices coming down today or not? For that, one thing I would just enter, so the two parties are stuck. Republicans want markets to cite the price, uh, and Democrats want some sort of reg regulation. Uh, I just raised this because it has shown up in polling on, and Republicans have done it. Uh, there's been an interest beneath the surface in importing drugs from Canada and Western Europe for many years, including Senator Cruz and Governor DeSantis introducing bills. So there may be something there that they could agree on uh, that aren't all prices. But it's a big mistake to think that physician fees and hospital charges are not on that list. When you give it to them, people are really worried about going to the ER and get a $12,000 bill. Uh, and why is it so high? Okay. so. We haven't even, we don't have all the results from the midterm election yet, but I am going to ask you about the next presidential election. It is two years away. Um, what does what happened in this election and what does health care and where we are in the political landscape, what does that tell us about how we will go into the presidential election, the presidential election season, and how health care will play in that? And what will be the factors? It's a really weak predictor. That's a long time from now. Uh, I will say this. I, I always say this. I believe this. A lot of it depends on whether or not there's a Democratic primary uh, for the nomination in 2024. 
whenever there's an active primary, Democrat voters, Democratic voters are incredibly concerned about health care in terms of access to care, uh, to, to extend care, to make care less more affordable, to have, uh, the extension of government programs. And if you have an active Democratic primary for the presidential nomination, you end up debating the health care policy around all of those dimensions. If Biden runs again and he's not challenged, I think it kind of tamps down, uh, tap down, tamps that down. And on the Republican side in the active nomination fight, um, health care is just not a Republican primary voter concern. So uh, just so we can use a real number on the Democratic side, this time health care and the advertising about health care was number five in priority. And the Republican candidate side, immigration was number five, and healthcare didn't show up. So it's very hard for me to see a Republican primary dealing with any kind of healthcare issue. Um, so, uh, but as I said, if there's a Democratic primary, they will, and that it tends to inject this role of government back into the debate about healthcare. That's so. But uh, any off-year election, its direct relationship to what happens in two years in America is really fairly weak. Uh, so uh, quickly, uh, why did healthcare rank lower than before the summer? And there are two answers to this. One was not on the exit poll and on bills and others uh, surveys. Uh, it was basically something called threats to democracy. Uh, that's not a usual policy, but that plus abortion drove other issues right off the agenda. And it's, it's also, in my belief, the reasons why the Democrats did so well. And unfortunately, a lot of people did not interview people who said that. If you said it, you voted for the Democrat. And it's around political extremism. The reason why I mentioned this is who's running for president in 2024? Is political extremism going to be a central issue? Uh, I think abortion is going to be a central issue because I don't see this Congress passing a new federal law. But the issue is, is extremism going to be there and it will impact other issues on the agenda? If the candidates are not involved with that argument, uh, these issues that Bill talks about are going to show up again in healthcare. Great. Bill and Bob, thank you so Thanks. much for sharing your expertise with us. Really appreciate it. And now we're going to move on to our second panel. Thank uh, you. Thanks very thank much. You. With Amy, Chris, and Jim. So welcome, Amy, Chris, and Jim. Uh, so Bob and Bill have really set us up for uh, for just a great discussion about what this all means, and I'm actually going to follow on with uh, the last question that I gave to them, and that is looking forward the next couple of years, what issues could possibly be bubbling up? We, you heard what they had to say uh, about where we may be in two years, but we really do have some serious issues that are continuing and getting worse. We have a lot of issues with uh, behavioral health, which uh, um, uh, got a lot worse during the pandemic, and we have a, a, just a, a real gap in, uh, between need and access. Um, we also have uh, a, a growing short workforce shortage, and it's not just nurses. It's uh, di direct care workers, the folks who give care to people in long-term care facilities and in the home. And this is this is turning out to be a big problem. I had I, we hear hospitals telling us consistently that they cannot discharge patients because they have, simply for the fact that they have no place to send them. And I had one hospital tell me. 20 to 25 percent of their patients are ready for discharge and they simply cannot get them out the door. Um, okay, so let's talk about the, uh, the factors that could be bubbling up or just simply continuing to be bad that could be in play in 2023 or 2023 and 2024. And uh, Amy, why don't we start with you? Okay, thanks, Marilyn. And it's a real treat to be able to hear from Bob and Bill before we have this discussion, because it really reaffirms a lot of what we expect to see uh, this Congress in terms of health care. So what we heard, or at least what I heard from Bob and Bill, is that um, we obviously live in a very divided country. We will have a very divided House and Senate. 
Um, we have very significant challenges facing our country in terms of healthcare dynamics that need to be addressed. And yet the American people have very differing views on those issues. And so some of the key factors to look at in terms of the polling that they just showed, it shows that in fact, an, an individual member of Congress is very likely to reflect the views of his own home district and to represent those views rather than necessarily looking for bipartisan solutions on those issues that are dividing our country. That said, I think if you look ahead to some of the issues that we expect Congress to undertake, many of them, in fact, are quite bipartisan. So when we look at things like telehealth, tackling uh, behavioral and mental health challenges, tackling the opioid epidemic, um, ensuring that we have affordable, um, personalized healthcare options that are available and, and, and emphasis on the affordability piece, although there are necessarily different ways to get at addressing those solutions. I think there are a lot of opportunities for bipartisanship, although they may be more incremental in nature. Chris, anything, Chris, anything to add in the way of which issues you think could be bubbling up? And, and we're going to get to the part about reality, the political landscape and realities, but what are the issues that are going to be pressuring policymakers? Uh, you're on mute, Chris. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> undergirding everything is um, something Bob has taught us for, and, and, and frankly, Bill, for years, is um, the public's frustration with how policymakers talk to them about um, health. Uh, you know, we don't frequently meet them where they are. They care about two things, really, cost and complexity, uh, and particularly cost and prices. And um, I think more and more policymakers are starting to understand that, and it helped drive some of the policy that was done by Democrats in this last Congress. I did want to say about this election, um, because I think it was an extraordinary uh, development that Republicans didn't do better um, than, um, than one would have thought. And I think the, my takeaway is similar um, to Bill's and Bob's, which is when you have a dynamic where people think you're going to take away something people value, uh, whether it's abortion rights or whether it, it's voting rights, um, suddenly those balance significant things out, and then you combine that with candidate dynamics, um, Democrats did much, much better than anyone thought they were going to be. I think they were they themselves, for the most part, were pretty surprised. Um, but those did overwhelm some of the traditional health care policies um, in this in this election. And if those are taken off the table, those threats, then I think we will go back to some of the traditional health care issues. And Democrats and Republicans will have different um, different visions as to what they can do. I don't think on cost containment on access, there's a lot of bipartisan um, agreement. I do think um, on targeted policies, very much like what Amy just laid out, there is absolutely possibilities for bipartisan work. We just saw today, uh, I think it was Senator Cassidy and someone else, I think it was Bennett maybe, uh, introduce legislation on uh, mental health with children and access issues. So you're, you're, you're going to see more and more of that on the mental health front, on certainly the opioid uh, and prevention and treatment front, uh, on the technology front, telehealth. Um, that's where I see real, real progress possibilities, and we can talk more in details about what that are later on. Uh, Jim, any other issues you wanted to add to this group? And I'd, I'd particularly be interested in your uh, take on um, uh, costs and prices and Medicare. <laughs> well, let's start with the last one, which is uh, I very much agree with our our polling uh, friends who who uh, advise strongly on you know walking very cautiously into such terrain. Uh, you know, I think this talk of, um, of you know, saying that people are going to use the debt limit to try to leverage changes on Medicare or Social Security, it seems kind of like really fanciful and uh, very unlikely that uh, it'll even get going. So I push that mostly to the side because that's going to require a bipartisan conversation. 
And I don't think President Biden is really interested in that bipartisan conversation himself at the moment, going into his, you know, potential re-election in 2024. So there'll be a lot of talk, a lot of posturing, a lot of thinking. Maybe some good work will be done. Um, some an an analysts will come forward with some ideas and some good conversations will take place. But very little action will take place on some big questions until after the next presidential election. By the way, Medicare's HI trust fund doesn't become depleted until a few years beyond that, at least under the current projections. And so there is, you know, the, they'll, the Congress will certainly take that time and say, you know, let's think about this a little longer. Um, but, you know, I think one dynamic I want to mention that hasn't been mentioned quite yet, which is that the, you know, it's been commented on a lot, but I don't think quite enough, which is that uh, in 2021 and 2022, a dynamic emerged in the Congress and in the Biden administration where a group of, it was a rotating group, 15, 20, 25 uh, Democrats and Republicans in the Senate basically took it upon themselves to be the center for advancing some pretty complex and big pieces of legislation. And they pushed through some big things that the President Biden is now taking full credit for, which is great. But I mean, a lot of it was really the work of a group of bipartisan senators who wanted to make sure they, they told the country, the Senate at least, still can work. And if you look at the record over 2021 and 2020, they produced a lot of stuff. I mean, you know, even a separate apart from the partisan, you know, reconciliation bill, there was a bipartisan infrastructure bill, there was a bipartisan, you know, uh, technology and science bill. Um, those were very large pieces of legislation. There was also a, a gun control measure that passed. Um, there's potential even for many more provisions to be attached to the bill in the lame duck session. I think that dynamic, the players who made that happen, are still in the Senate. They're still interested in doing the same thing. And some of that can apply to not big, huge issues in healthcare, but bite sized issues <laughs> like mental health, like substance abuse, like rural hospital access. And I think, you know, in the right context, in the right setting, bills can be produced that may not make the biggest headlines, that may not, you know, make uh, cable news and so on, but will still be important and make a difference. And I know President Biden knows the Senate very well. And my guess is he expects that that's where he can make some additional progress in 2023 and 2024. So I would look for that dynamic to emerge again. Um, and there's some, you know, like I said, I think there's some bipartisan group of senators. They really want to make sure the Senate works and doesn't completely paralyzed. And that group is still there. The core of that group is there and they want to keep going. So keep an eye on that. Um, now I'll stop there and we can go on to your next question, I think. Okay, let's take a half a step back. And I'd really like to hear uh, from both uh, Amy and Chris in particular about political reality and what the Congress is going to look like. Uh, the House just changed hands. Amy, I know you pay particular attention to the Republican makeup and the Republican who's vying for committee chairmanships and who's going to be in charge over there. Um, so I'd love to hear from you first about what is the leadership going to look like and what who who uh, who is going to be in key positions. Uh, from the Republican side and what that means for health care, health and health care issues. Absolutely. So on the Republican side of the aisle, we will see some significant change in leadership at the committees. So um, some, some stability as well. So Kathy McMorris Rogers will likely continue on at Energy and Commerce. Um, Senator Mike Crapo will continue on at the Senate Finance Committee in the, in the Republican leadership chair. Um, at the House Ways and Means Committee, however, we have a three-way race um, for the chairmanship. Each one of the candidates there, I think, um, will very likely produce a similar result in terms of the, the focus and the um, identification of issues that are possible in the committee. So whether it's one of the Smiths or Mr. Buchanan, they all tend to be very conservative and also um, very aligned with, with bipartisan work as well. So they each have a track record of bipartisanship on a, on a number of issues in healthcare, which we can go through. Um, I think one of the most notable changes will be in the Senate Help Committee, however, where Senator Cassidy 
um, will likely take the leadership role on the Republican side. And he really has a tremendous record of bipartisan action. Um, as I think Chris mentioned, um, he's very involved in a number of issues, inclu including mental health, including tackling, I would say, some of the more challenging issues that require really kind of digging in and wrestling to the ground some, some difficult policy decisions. And he's not afraid uh, to dig in and do that. And as I think uh, Jim outlined as well, what we're likely to see is a tremendous amount of focus in the House on oversight, as is, is often the case in a closely divided House. They will oversee some of the key concerns that they've had in terms of implementation of some of the COVID funding, some of the um, questions about the origin of the coronavirus, for example, um, concerns about the CDC and NIH, things that, that we've already talked about. Um, there, but that oversight is intended to really drive a policy agenda. Whereas in the Senate, I think we're likelier to see um, some more bipartisan action, whether it's through these gangs that we've discussed or whether it's through bipartisan action at the committee level. Now, Senator Cassidy will have to work with a, a, a different counterpart on the Democratic side. I'll let Chris speak to that. But I do think there's a, a tremendous alignment on the issues that I mentioned previously. Uh, and they are very bipartisan in nature. So whether it's, it's mental health, substance use, telehealth, um, empowering patients. I think those are really the key agenda items that are likely to move forward in the next Congress. Okay, so we'll get, we'll get back to that and, and exactly how and in what, through what vehicles we may be able to see some, some movement. But Chris, what, what are the key changes from the Democrat uh, perspective? Who are some going to be some of the key players here? Well, I think in the House, you're going to see the Democratic leadership be a little bit more deferential to the committees of jurisdiction. Um, you know, when you're in the minority uh, in the House, which uh, by a few votes we will be, um, it's a little bit easier. You're not governing. Um, and so the disparities and differences in, in that do exist in the Democratic Party will not be as, as evident. Um, the, the responsibility will be to work with the House leadership, whomever that may be, and the Republican side on occasion, and then also to be the loyal opposition on, on other occasions. And to start developing policies um, that don't get done in the next Congress for the next Congress that uh, follows. Uh, the new leader, Democratic uh, leader Jeffries, uh, Catherine Clark, um, and also Pete Aguilar actually don't have big long healthcare records uh, or, or associations. Um, they kind of play both sides. Uh, they're careful. Um, I think going in, they're gonna say, oh, I'll let the committees do it. But uh, as Amy well knows, the, the, the committees don't always agree amongst themselves about how you should proceed. And so leadership will have to re-engage um, at the end of each process. Usually it's in the budget deal uh, and usually it is in uh, Democratic broader messaging perspective. So I would look towards going back to Richie Neal, uh, look at Frank Pallone. They'll still, if anything, they'll have more visibility in the House, although they will be in the minority, so they will not carry the agenda. In the Senate, you know, Senator Wyden, uh, Senator Schumer will continue to play a major leadership role, uh, as he always has. Uh, Senator Wyden uh, will be working with Senator Crapo. Interestingly about Senator Cassidy, he's on both the Finance Committee and on the Health Committee, and there's also Democrats on both committees, which, which I think opened the door up for possible actual some coordination and organization between the two. I, I think people think it's a little bit amusing to see uh, Cassidy and Senator Sanders take over the Senate Health Committee and become the chairman. Um, he, he's well known for his Medicare for all that is not really in his jurisdiction and the Senate Health Committee, he'll probably still talk about it quite a bit. Uh, but um, what people fail to remember about Senator Sanders is when he's chairman of a committee, whether it's veterans or budget or whatever, and he has to come up with legislative agreements, he usually has. So I, I think people will be surprised that he utilizes his staff and works with Senator Cassidy to actually get some of these targeted policies done, particularly on things on mental health that he cares about, community health centers that he cares a lot about uh, as interesting platforms to address some of these workforce challenges that we're seeing in the mental health space. 
Okay, we have a couple of uh, questions from the audience, but I'm gonna I'm gonna throw in one more question before we get there. What are the must pass pieces of healthcare legislation this year, or the must pass pieces of legislation that could end up being vehicles or opportunities for healthcare movement? And I'll open that up to anyone. Well, I'll start by just mentioning uh, it's obvious that we are in the middle of one of those periods right now, right? Because uh, the, the the appropriation bill that didn't get passed, you know, in September is now sitting there. And so there's lots of conversation around this very large omnibus bill. The same dynamic will occur again, likely next December. So, you know, in some ways, it's a recurring theme in a Congress where they they kind of wait and, and until the very last minute at the end of the year to do a huge deal across a lot of di different dimensions. And right now, some of the issues that will be decided in this December may be back again next December and, be, and need another must pass fix. So for instance, I think it's very likely Congress will do something to avert a reduction in Medicare physician fees, uh, but they may make it a one year fix, right? So then again, next December, you'll be faced with another possibility in, in January, 2024 of a big, Medicare physician fee cut. And so they may have to do that a couple of times until they come around to a longer term fix. So that would be a big one. Um, there's also some hospital payment cuts that uh, they're likely to undo. Um, there's some extenders in Medicare that need to be attended to this December and could be uh, expiring again next December. So I think those are the main ones that come to mind that are already right in front of us right now and probably will be right in front of us again uh, a year from now. I would note that the bill that they passed in August, the Inflation Reduction Act, included the ACA subsidies now through 2025. So it's that it, that will become a very big issue after the presidential election in 2025. And just a couple, Jim did a nice job describing what's out there, a couple of additional ones to keep in mind. Um, this year, there's an effort to address um, potentially pandemic pr preparedness in the lame duck. Um, Senator Burr and Senator Murray have worked on the prevent um, legislation that they're attempting to include in a year end package. Unclear if that will happen. If it doesn't next year, there's a, a bill expiring that has to be addressed as well, um, where it's more of a public private partnership type approach to pandemic preparedness. Also, community health center, center funding will need to be addressed next year, as well as PEPFAR. Um, two very bipartisan issues. Um, President Bush was very engaged, as was sadly the recently departed Mike Gerson um, in, in, that, in that bill and that effort as well. In addition to you know, ongoing efforts at the committee process level to really address some really challenging issues such as macro reform to make physician payment more responsive to physicians, um, dual eligibility um, reforms for people who are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. So recently a request for information was put forward on, on that. So many interesting policy ideas that are, are actually quite important and, and could make meaningful change in the healthcare space next year, either this year or next year. Marilyn, I just, one, one last thing, I'll just say that probably something that uh, has to get done this year is uh, Puerto Rico financing and issues with regard to uh, a very troubled Medicaid program. So, and there's well, some bipartisan interest in doing that, even in a lame duck type dynamic. And that's gonna be probably ongoing too, although some, some people would like to get it off the table for several years. Um, and that's another areas we haven't yet talked about, but um, going into next year, many people expect the public health emergency to, 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 to sunset. And if it does, there will be uh, real concerns about disruption of coverage with millions of people uh, in the Medicaid programs across many states. And there may be some interest, hopefully some, in, that definitely is on the Democratic side, but some interest uh, on the Republican side to avert some of the most significant problems on the, in that space. And there's a lot of bipartisan, uh, very targeted Medicaid policy that is out there too, um, you know, including postpartum care, including money falls the people, uh, policies that um, have always traditionally been pretty bipartisan, and there may be some vehicles um, that um, these entities generally will have to be attached to. They generally won't go freestanding, but um, uh, 
as you can see, it's not as though nothing's happening. It's just to Jim's point, probably nothing that hits the national media. You know, if it's bipartisan and it's an agreement, it's usually not a lot of news. Mm -hmm. So, uh, although Paul it should be, it should be in this context. Right. Okay. So Paul Heldman in the audience brings up a really good question. He wants to know, Jim, how your theory on bipartisan interest in bite-sized issues such as mental health. I'm not sure I call mental health a bite-sized issue, but it could be taken in pieces. Um, and uh, how does that get through a more partisan house? And is there, I'm going to add to Paul's question, is there a way to take some of these issues like mental health, where there is strong bipartisan support, to take some of that and use some of these uh, must pass pieces of legislation to get things done, or how do you get those bite sized pieces done? Well, I, you know, how the House is going to operate remains somewhat of a mystery. So I'm not, I, I really am not entirely clear myself exactly what the new dynamic will be in, in the chamber, the lower chamber of our Congress. But uh, normally, even in a very partisan House, even a you know, run by the Republicans, there's usually a, some pressure among, from the, the members to their leadership saying, hey, we can't just do nothing forever. You know, I, I want to get I'd like to go home and say I did a few things, you know, and let's do some things that are not going to be, you know, um, uh, things that we can take credit for, too, in addition to many Democrats also taking credit for them. And uh, I think things like, you know, a, a renewed effort around substance abuse treatment access um, you know, there's a lot of need out there in the country for better options. And so, you know, if you're a Republican member of the House, that's probably something you, you would like to see done. OK, so I think things like that, if they're done in the right context with the right tone, even the House and even a partisan House probably is going to want to pass a few things. Right. So I, I think some of those things can still make it. I don't know if I can predict at this moment exactly the dynamic, but it might be a year end bill. I mean, unfortunately, the way we work right now is this bill that they're working on now. I mean, it could be a 2,000, 2,500 page bill, you know, that we all see on uh, on uh, December 23rd or something. Well, and and adding to that, if we want to see, you know, what can be done in the House this year, they've already produced a bipartisan package on mental health that passed the full House in a bipartisan way. Um, they've already produced a bipartisan package of FDA both funding and reforms um, in the House. So I know the narrative is that the House won't be able to produce anything, but I think on these key issues, there really is a strong track record of, of getting bills across the finish line. And now it's a matter of negotiating the differences between the House and the Senate. And is that is that going to, Amy, you feel confident that's still gonna be the case with the change in control and the new leadership? I do. I think on the on the issues, as I think everyone has pointed out, that are truly compelling to the American people in a bipartisan way, like substance abuse, like telehealth, like, you know, like the issues we've talked about already, I think there is a very good likelihood they could be enacted either this year or next year. OK, so we have another question from the audience, and, and this has to do with uh, long term care. And I, I really want to get your take on this because during the pandemic, we had a lot of trouble with nursing homes and the workforce. We are continuing to have trouble with the workforce in nursing homes to the point where some nursing homes have closed. Others are limiting the number of, of, of folks they will take in the nursing homes. But perhaps just as significant, the pandemic really shined a light on home health and home care. And uh, here we also have workforce challenges, but we, ha we have a lot of challenges. And um, uh, Bob had a slide in the first panel regarding government developing programs to serve seniors uh, and, and people with disabilities. So is there any chance that uh, the attention that we saw during the pandemic on nursing home care and on home health care could be enough to bring up the issue of long-term care again? And is it possible in this political landscape? I'll start by just saying not in a big way. I don't think, you know, the, the question of 
adding a major new benefit to, to Medicare or a vast expansion in what Medicaid is paying for for people. I, I think those are too big for this Congress probably to digest, and they, they aren't haven't ripened enough. There's no idea on the table that has got a lot of momentum behind it at the moment. So I, I think what they're going to do is what they've been doing, which is to try to figure out for this population, what do we need to do to make sure the Medicare skilled nursing benefit is properly functioning and paying adequate amounts? The Biden administration has already started a quality review assessment and initiative looking into what's been going on in nursing care for seniors. That will have an effect. And then, of course, you know, the perennial issue of what do we do about the people with the low income population that are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid that often need long term services and supports. Um, that's still an ongoing question and many different efforts are underway to try to deal with it better, but none of them fully satisfactory. So that, to be honest with you, that'd be something that would be really worthwhile for the Congress to dig into and see if there is some bipartisan way forward, not a big bang kind of change, but something that would make a difference and improve coordination and make it more accessible for people to get this care and maybe put some more money into it. So that the pay can go up and you can attract more workers. Yeah, the dual the duals is inviting not just because of the need, but because there's already resources on the table for Medicare and Medicaid. So reallocating it more efficiently and thoughtfully and improving care coordination has appeal. There's a lot of interest in the private sector as well as the public sector. Um, actual innovations that show progress have potential implications for downstream work as well. So there's a lot of incentives for all sides, left and right, to do something. Um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation has indicated they're interested in doing more in this space as well, and particularly focus on populations with dementia. Um, so I don't think these, I think you're right to raise these issues, Marilyn, because they have been highlighted. But the big bang intervention is going to be very difficult in a split government. And it wasn't even when the Democrats were in total control, we couldn't find the resources necessary to do things, even though there was a there is absolutely a demand and interest in in moving on that, um, at least from from my side of the aisle. Um, so I, I the last thing I did want to say is you can have some benefits and coverage, but if we also don't address the workforce issues um, in these areas, we're going to have some real problems. And I, I honestly, and, and probably Jim's tired of me talking about this, but uh, the idea that we're going to address these workforce issues or even the issues of solvency and Medicare downstream without also thoughtfully thinking about immigration reform, to me, is uh, very short-sighted and unlikely uh, if we don't. And uh, so I I don't think these are siloed issues. I think these are very integrated issues that we have to think through thoughtfully. Believe it or what? not, I'm in total, total agreement with Chris. How about that? Wow, let's stop. <laughs> <laughs> Mission accomplished. There's our bipartisanship. Uh, Amy, were you going to weigh in there? I was just going to add, there's also a tremendous amount of bipartisanship on providing additional opportunities for, for people to stay in their home setting. Um, so money follows the person. Um, Kathy McMorris Rogers has been very involved in helping people with disabilities have tax preferred options to, to work and to stay in their home environment. Um, so I think there is a lot of opportunity on those issues as well, which really are about kind of allowing people to make choices about where and how they age. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so we only have a few minutes left, and uh, before I close things up, I just want to ask each of you, is there a particular issue, look into your crystal ball, that you could see potentially Congress grabbing in a bipartisan way on health care in 2023? If you had to pick, if you had to pick just, just one issue, what do you think has the best chance? And not something that must pass. Well, I'll take I'll take the easiest one. I'll go first and take the easy one, leave the tough one for my colleagues. But I think telehealth is really one of the most bipartisan, most compelling issues. And I do think there's certainty to a certain extent in the in the law now um, beyond the PHE, but it is a time limited um, provision. And so I think there's a lot of interest in extending that and giving more certainty to people that they can continue to, to access telehealth. 
All right, Chris. Well, since we've mentioned three, um, I'll just mention one of them. I, 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 and although the third one is related, um, but I do think uh, mental health, particularly for children, is an area that um, there is great interest in, and um, at least some important down payments. I don't think we're going to solve anything. Again, we have huge workforce challenges in mental health that you can't just snap your fingers and address them. Telehealth will help, um, but it doesn't address it satisfactorily. Um, it will include, by the way, non-specialists like community health workers integrated in teams that that really work to better serve particularly underserved populations but i i think there's some real interest on all levels of um, both parties to make some real improvements jim i think uh you know more effort on rural health is probably something even the republican house will be pretty interested in and uh and so something to shore up and think about access to services, some through hospitals, maybe some creative thinking in the non-hospital setting. Telehealth certainly is part of that, but maybe even beyond it. So maybe an effort on rural health and access to services in rural, rural America. Well, I, I'm thrilled with all of the issues that you all just mentioned because BPC is doing work in all of those areas. Uh, if you'd like to see some of our reports and some of our work on um, uh, long-term care, on behavioral health, we have a, a whole body of work on behavioral health integration and the workforce. On telehealth, we just completed a, a, an, an enormous Medicare data analysis and um, uh, to help inform some recommendations that we have made regarding the future of telehealth, please visit our website at bipartisanpolicy.org. We also have a recent report on improving programs of all-inclusive care for the elderly um, that we released in October. U.S. Senators Tom Carper and Bill Cassidy introduced the Bipartisan PACE Part D Choice Act a few weeks ago. Um, and that would help address the PACE Part D drug coverage and price issue. In addition, uh, I wanted to let you all know we're going to be hosting a virtual webinar like the one today on Tuesday, December 20th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern to highlight a new report on improving the Medicaid buy-in for workers with disabilities. Um, so please join us. Um, in, in these uh, different uh, events, these upcoming events that we have, if you're not on our list, please get on our website and sign up, look at some of our work. And also, I would very much like to thank all of our panelists today for, for really, there's so much to talk about. We could have gone on another three hours, but uh, we do have a much better sense now of where we are. And I thank you very much. And thank you for joining us today. And we'll see you next Marilyn. time. Marilyn, yes. remember, we're, we're also celebrating World AIDS Day. Thank you. We're celebrating World AIDS Day. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> okay. <laughs>